Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to webinar week number five, day number two um, of yet another coach education series masterclass conversation. Delighted today uh, to be joined by Mr. Tony Anan, who is obviously, as many of you know, the academy director down at Atlanta United. Um, so we thank Tony greatly for sharing this hour of time with us, uh, and obviously Mr. Mark Wilson in the in the hot seat along with me, Tom Shields. Um, so to everybody that's tuning in now or, or later, thank you obviously for, for choosing Beyond Pulse and spending some of your day with us. Um, just a, a quick shout out again, specifically to the coaches on the line that may have missed or, or not seen uh, our Active Minutes project and the launch of that last week with Beyond Pulse. So uh, if you're looking for ways to stay connected with your, your players and uh, the coaches, the, the teams within your or your club during this obviously difficult time, um, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to, to introduce you to ways that you can stay connected and, and help your kids stay active. So um, just a, a reminder on that. Um, but as we move into this, obviously, thank you again for, for being here. I'm going to let Tony introduce him, um, uh, introduce himself, sorry, provide a little bit of a, a background into the wealth of experience that he's he's obviously covered and, um, and gained in the last 20 or so years here in the US, ranging from <coughs> youth national teams and scouting roles and education to obviously now his, his job um, down in Atlanta. So Tony, without further ado, mate, if I can turn it over to you. Um, and again, thank you for, for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, Give you a quick introduction. Um, I've been in the States 25 years. Uh, came over playing college soccer, like many many Brits that are over here. Um, played a year at Lindsay Wilson, then transferred to Atlanta. I was actually on my way home, ready to go back, and uh, ended up playing for another school in Atlanta that I've never left since. So Atlanta's been my home for 24 years. Uh, started out coaching at the lowest levels of uh, Club Concord Fire. Went from Concord Fire to No Cross Soccer as the director of coaching, then the executive director. I then uh, merged Concord Fire with United Football Academy, which is now UFA, the, the big club in Georgia, and also started uh, Georgia United at the same time, which was a, the first DA program in the country that brought five teams together without uh, the kids having to pay, so it was a fully funded program. Um, Stuck at that. I was assistant coach with the Silverbacks for a season. I was also uh, assistant coach for the US Power Olympic team for two years with Stu Sharp. Um, did a scouting role for US soccer at the time before I started the DA with George United. Um, so I've kind of been in many facets of youth football for a long time and just dipped my toe in the professional game with the Silverbacks with Gary Smith for one year, which was a great experience. But I think all of those things came together when Atlanta United started. They uh, basically came, recruited me, and asked me if I would be interested in becoming their academy manager um, under Richard Money, who was the hired academy director. And of course, I jumped at the chance because it was the level I'd always wanted to work at. So uh, here I am going into the, the fifth year of Atlanta United's youth season, even though we've missed the back part of this season. Um, yeah. I'm, like I say, I've been in Atlanta a long time and I know the market very well of the Southeast, even the, the national market. And there's a lot of good people working within the market of youth football. And it's a pleasure to know so many people that the game has given me over the years. So it's uh, that's kind of my short journey to the, where I am now, the academy yeah. director, and head of player development. Absolutely. And um, a very modest and humble account of, of the journey that you've been on and obviously some of the, the things that you've you've accomplished and achieved along the way that we'll we'll dive into the more that we, we get going in this conversation. But um <clears throat> obviously Tom when we when we spoke the one thing that um I think you have a a great a great depth of knowledge of and experience within is is the concept of of leading clubs, organizations, teams of people, obviously both coaches and and players um and that's obviously where we're going to kind of take most of the conversation today just diving into uh recommendations from a leadership perspective and um and obviously what we'll, we'll talk about which we titled the conversation which was expecting excellence and, and how you've obviously created a culture down there that um is is thriving and producing some incredibly talented youngsters and, and teams that are playing some breathtaking football so um before we get into that though as as you know i've kind of opened some of these conversations with 
with looking at sources of inspiration and, and giving shout outs to uh, to either people of influence or to um, to tips and advice that people have gained throughout their careers. So what I'm going to ask you is if you can give me a five aside team of assets that you think a good leader should have or things that you personally are conscious of demonstrating within your leadership style. So yeah, some of that? Um, I think I would start with I'm going to I'm kind of going to double head both of them because I think there's a mixture of a lot of things, but you can put them under one title. So I yeah. say number one would be honesty and transparency. That's the number one. That's my striker in the team. You have to be honest and you've got to be transparent. You've got to be clear in your message. Um, number two would be become a really good listener and be able to respond to people. Um, Listening is a, is a is an art. It's a skill, and it's uh, I think it's acquired with practice, and it's acquired over time. Obviously, I feel like I'm in my mid forties now, and I'm a better listener now than I've ever been. Um, my wife would probably disagree with that, but in football world, I'm a better listener. Um, but I think it's really important to listen and uh, let people be heard and listen to people's opinion without interjecting, without getting in the way of it. I think you learn a lot from listening um, rather than just sort of having a conversation and letting it wash over you. So um, third, number three, a mixture of being humble and being hungry. I think you have to stay very, very humble. And some of the greatest people I've met in management, coaching, business in life have been very humble in their approach, but they've also got that hunger that's still there underneath. So. A mixture of being hungry, uh, sorry, humble and and hungry. Um, number four, resolute and brave. Um, you have to be if you're going to lead and you're going to be at the front and you're going to be the guy setting the standards. You've got to be resolute. You're going to have to overcome things, but resolute and being brave is is part of being a good leader. And then your number five would be. And I say this in a lot of interviews and seminars and whatever that I've done is be authentic. Just be yourself. Um, it helps you communicate for yourself. I think if you pretend to be somebody else or talk in a way that you don't really understand because you're trying to be somebody else, um, that other people will like you because of that. I think that's a, it's a big mistake that people lead uh, people make in leadership. I've seen a lot of people on my travels, on my journey that have changed and morphed into different people. And you can see they struggle with keeping up that appearance. So for me, it's it's just be authentic, be real, be straight and be a good communicator. That would be my top five challenges as a leader. It sounds so easy when you say it like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Years in fact. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody on the line can attest to the fact that practice and failure. Yeah, well, no, it's it's an important lesson. Um, but no, look, I, I think it's always having somebody like you and obviously the positions that you've held reinforce some of the messages that I'm sure people have heard, you know, countless times. Um, but it just it resonates that little bit, little bit more deeply when obviously it comes from people of the positions, um, positions that you work within. So. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if there's if there's questions about it that people want to kind of note down and, and ask um, examples. Obviously, we can get into that a little bit later. But Tom, thank you for for that starting point. Um, obviously, with all that in mind, then we we're going to dive into to your history and your experience of the types of cultures that you've tried to create. And obviously, for the benefit of of people that might be a little less familiar. You've you've blended major club organizations. So you've been an executive director, DOC, you've managed, you've managed other business managers or or directors. You've also obviously managed a team of staff that you have right now. You've obviously also managed players. So there are different caveats of this conversation that I want people just to be kind of conscious of. Um, it's not just simply a, a coach to player relationship that we're going to discuss. Um, it's a very broad start, but but can you talk us through a little bit about how you've created some of the cultures that you operate in? And and I want to speak specifically on two different two different tangents. One is 
from a club leadership perspective and how you create the buy-in and accountability from maybe when you're managing across locations or you're managing laterally, boy side, girl side, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Um, and then also now, obviously we had one of your, your staff and a very good friend of mine, Mr. Matt Lowry on a few weeks ago. And away from the call, he's always spoken about the, the type of togetherness and you know camaraderie that's on display at Atlanta United and the coaches will watch each of the sessions and support. And that's very intentional clearly as well. So could you kind of taper it from a, an elite academy approach and then also you know more of a an executive director director of coaching perspective in a, in a club position as well yeah is that all that's all mate. Yeah, easy <laughs> all right an hour for that? Um, we can we can just stop there that may be the end of the conversation right there <laughs> um i mean if i start with where i am today and yeah. uh, right now i manage what 17 people under under me that are directly reports to me that are the staff of academy and uh, academy atlanta's academy yeah um and me, people might think all right that's 17 people that's not so bad i manage 50 i manage 60 and i'll get to where 10 years ago i was managing 120 people for ufa yeah. but believe it or not managing the 17 in this environment it's probably the most difficult task I've had in my whole career, because not only are you in an elite environment where it's a lot of alphas and it's a sporting environment where it's all football and it's all every day. Um, you're not dealing with parents very much. You're not mm -hmm. dealing with businesses, with tournaments, with camps. You're not dealing with the day-to-day -day club issues that come up. Um, which you might think is 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 tough, but managing elite coaches in an elite environment where the standard is being set so high is quite a hard management. It's quite hard management to do because you've got to manage up and you have to manage down. And managing down seems easy enough. It seems like it's, you know, you tell somebody what to do, you set them a task, you keep them on track, you give a deadline, but you've also got to keep them engaged. And you've also got to make sure that they don't lose track of where they're going and they're not looking too far ahead and you've got to keep them obviously humble, right? But the managing up piece is probably the most difficult piece of this environment. You have to manage up to a technical director, a president, communication, social media. You've got to kind of manage your ways with them as well. So the challenge is managing up and down. And I think managing up is very difficult. Uh, but managing down is equally as important, is what I would say. So the culture we've tried to create within our system is the camaraderie. So I treat it like a team, just like I do a team of players. I treat the coaching staff exactly the same. They're all held to the similar standards. There's no favoritism. There's no, he gets away with this and he gets away with that. You've obviously got to be flexible, but you've got to maintain You've got to maintain a level that everyone can adhere to if you want them all to to walk the same way and you know sing the same song cliche but that's what it is um so yes the environment we foster is togetherness sharing you know nobody has their own ball bag their own cones their own bibs it's it's all shared we all look after each other's equipment down to that level of looking after each other the second part of that is including everyone. So whatever we do, we try to include everybody in the process, try to include everybody in everything that's going on. And I will set tasks for people to do, and they may not even know that it's a task that I'm, I'm watching for their character flow, I'm watching for their, how they react to that. But everybody's included in everything. So when we did our principles of play, when we did our way of working, it wasn't me sitting at the head of the table saying, this is how we're doing it. And if you don't like it, there's the door. What do you think? What do you think? How do you think we should work? The staff came to me and said, look, the schedule, can we do this? Can we do that? Of course we can. As long as the work's done, we can do that. So I think being open and being flexible with the staff that you can manage, the size, the number, obviously you can't do that with 120 people, but you can do it with a small elite staff, being open and being very... Um, inclusive of everybody's ideas, 
being inclusive of everybody's opinion, knowing that the book stops with you, but the process of getting to that has to be inclusive of everybody around you. That will empower people. After you empower people, they'll want to work. They'll want to work more, they'll want to be involved more, they'll want to do more. And that spills over to what you're talking about on the field, where you'll see our under 14 coach at our under 17 session and jumping in sometimes and asking if he can be involved. You'll see uh, someone like a Matt Lowry, who is an endless worker, who's unbelievable at what he does, but you'll see him on the 19s bench, even though he's managing the 14s, 13s, and 12s. That's where you start to see people think, you know what, I have some ownership in this. I just don't work here. I don't come in and punch a clock and Tony tells me what to do every day. I own this with him and I work with him. I don't work for him. And I think that's a big part of what I've tried to do is tell everybody, look, the book stops at my door. I'm the one whose name's on the door and who's responsible for production. And I will take it and I'll protect you guys as much as I can. But we all have to work together in a common goal in the pursuit of what we call excellence. Um, but if you don't include everybody and you don't let them feel empowered and you don't elevate people around you, you've got no chance. It won't last. It can't last. And there's no way you can build a culture without empowering people and without elevating people around you. And then <clears throat> into the more, the more broader club cultures where you're bringing groups together from maybe different backgrounds, maybe different locations, like some strategies to share <clears throat> with, with regards to how you successfully manage that? Yeah, I think, again, this is where it's almost another level of management, another facet of management, where you bring five, let's say you bring five DOCs together. All five DOCs have their own opinions. All five DOCs have their own attitude. And to be honest, they all have their own ego. Because mm -hmm. everybody has that ego in the game. To work in the game, you have to have a little bit of the ego. It's how you control the ego. So the very first meeting of that was, listen, let's all check it at the door. Don't come in the room and try and push your agenda and push your attitude. Let's check everything at the door and let's have a football conversation. And from day one, of trying to bring five, six people together with thousands of kids. I mean, that was like 12,000 kids all together. And these were the leaders of thousands and thousands of kids. So it's a hard thing to do to walk in the room and say, okay, my way may not be the best way, so I'm going to sit and listen to everybody else's way. Um, that was challenging. That was really challenging. At that time, it was really challenging because you had four or five guys in the room every meeting who had their own agenda for their couple of thousand kids and their board and their club. And it was difficult. Um, but like I said, the reminder and the culture of let's check the ego, let's all be even, let's all be balanced, let's all try and be the same, walk in the same direction, was the main drive behind that collection of people. And it wasn't easy, but I think the accountability, and this is where accountability comes in, I think the accountability of it um, held everybody to that, I want to be this guy, that's the leader, that's this, that's that, but I can't because these guys will hold me accountable for that. So the culture of accountability when you bring in four or five major players together is the most important piece. Everybody has to be accountable. So we divvied up all responsibilities. And even though I had brought it all together, I didn't take the head role. And I thought that was a, it was a strategic move, but it was also, I wanted to be the football guy. So I took the technical director role rather than the executive director who might have got all the plaudits for bringing George United together. And I empowered somebody else with that role, but that their accountability in that role was even greater than mine. It was financial, it was thing that, mine was football. I was accountable for the football, which hopefully we did a good job with. Um, so I think accountability, when you're bringing multiple people together in the same, at the same level, accountability is the number one thing that needs to be at the forefront of every conversation. 
and it holds it holds me accountable to to put the squads together to get the the, the football on the field. It right. held him together to make sure the financials were in good state and we weren't in trouble and we could pay everybody who was getting paid. <clears throat> Sorry, who was getting paid. So that was the next sort of. To be honest, that process there helped me in the process where I am now. Right. Because I made major, we made some major mistakes. We made some major, we had some major flaws in the setup because we were trying to keep everybody happy and trying to keep everybody in check. Um, so I think the mistakes we made there are carried into my elite, what I call the elite arena of management now. So. Would you be comfortable sharing just one or two without going into too many details? Just again, the mistakes, the mistakes, um, empowering the wrong person, putting the wrong person in the wrong seat. Okay. Because again, a little cliche of everyone has to get on the right seat in the bus, but it's so, so important to success. If you have the wrong person in the wrong chair, they can drag the whole thing down. And at times during that process, we had some people in the wrong positions. That was probably the biggest thing I learned was, you know, don't worry about people's feelings so much as getting the, getting everybody in the right place so you can go in the right direction. That's probably the biggest lesson we learned for me. Can I, can I chime in for a second? In, yeah. I think that's a bit of advice. One of the best bits you gave Tony at the start was listening. Um, and it's taken me nearly 25 minutes before I felt the need to chime in. Um, <laughs> and intently to everything you're you're saying, some you know really key bits of info. And in the essence of just stepping back to a word you used earlier, authenticity, and relating that to one when you build your culture and your sets of principles and your core values, there are people that may come into your environment that have three of those values or you know two or three of those beliefs but who want to remain authentic as well and in terms of when you link that to the failure of empowering sometimes the wrong people and i feel i've been in this position before and, and failed in that way is there a case of that person claiming their authenticity is more valuable than the core principle or core beliefs of the actual club and the culture there um, and are there any mechanisms you put in place to allow people to be authentic, but also adhere to the core values and principles of the club? It's a great question. That's a great, uh, it's quite, it's provoking in the way that it's, it, it happens all the time, especially now, because you're bringing in what we consider the best coaches we can find in the country or outside the country, um, who have their own thoughts, their own agenda, their own way of working. Um, people like, uh, for example, Jack Tollison, who came from West Ham. I mean, his pedigree from the Premier League and coaching in the Premier League at the youth level, he's bound to have different opinions to what we are or what we have. But he's embraced our principles of play. He's embraced the way we work. But he's allowed to stay Jack Collison. We don't want to lose Jack Collison because Jack Collison is a very valuable piece for us. Right. So when you say, do you allow them to be authentic? Absolutely. Everybody has to be authentic within the boundaries of what you set as your culture. So, again, if your culture is expressive and you can elevate people and you allow people to do their thing, they will accept what your culture is and they will accept your way of working while maintaining who they are. And your buddy, Matt, I mean, Matt, for me, Matt's always tapping away and he's on projects and he's got this project going, he's got that project going. I never stand in Matt's way and say, hey, could you not do that project and could you do what I'm asking you to do? Because I always know Matt will get it done if I ask him to do something. But I, am, I elevate Matt. Matt's the academy manager. He came in as the 12s guy. He was the best 12s guy I've seen. He went to the 14s, 15s, and he's done a great job there. So I look at him and go, right, I need to elevate this kid because this kid's got a future in the game. And I can't sit on Matt and keep him down because then I take away Matt's personality, I take away Matt's creativity. And I think Matt will tell you, me and Matt don't say eye to eye all the time. There's definitely things he doesn't like about me and I don't like about him, but we're respectful. I give him his space, I give him his time. And I think Matt embraces what we are 
because he's allowed to be who he is. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, the answers. To your draw. point, I think as long as you, there are boundaries to which the culture allows that person to be himself. Now, if Matt, if Matt, I'm, I'm picking on Matt a little bit because he picked on me when he was on here. Yeah, I'm sure. But, um, the uh, if, if I if I sit on Matt and I squash Matt and I say, look, there's time for you, Matt. You're a young guy. You can, you know. Matt eventually will stop not believing in what we're doing. He'll start questioning. He'll start thinking, what am I doing? This is not me. This is not what I want to do. So, but if I empower Matt and give him enough, he'll work with me and we'll get further down the line because of it. So that's kind of my approach when we've had, to be honest, we've had people in that um, didn't make it here, who we released and let go because they would not work within the boundaries of what was set. And there was a bit of selfishness and there was a bit of me, 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 which is fine. Out of other places, you might get away with that. But at our place, you can't be me, 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 me. You have to be us and be me over here. So it's not like we haven't held people accountable for that either. And like you said, do I set tests? I'm always laying little tests around just to see what people do. It's part of it. It's like being a coach to try and bring out the cult, uh, the character of your players. You always lay a little trap. Do they fall in? Do they step over it? I'm always on that, but I'm not, I'm not manipulative with it and I'm not, you know, sneaking around behind them doing it. It's just, they don't even know sometimes that it's there, but does that answer your question? I kind of rambled a bit, but. Absolutely. No, that's, um, that was the answer I would have expected from a, a club having uh, the levels of success you're having, Tony, at youth right. level. Um, Tony, let's let's go into what expect excellence means then, because that is obviously the culture that you've built. Um, that is how you obviously <laughs> live your your day to day. Um, the the we before me kind of the bios concept, the everything that's in it together, and and the standards that you clearly hold yourself and each other to. So, talk to us about where it came from. Talk to us about what it means in action. Um, and yeah, like how how it's seen on a day to day basis with with what you guys do. Um, it's a difficult one to answer, right? What is excellence? How do you what, expect excellence? I personally, I think it's a uh, I think excellence is a goal. It's a pursuit. Um, it's continuing to try and reach it. It's in, continue to try and improve on everything you're doing because if you're not continuing to improve you're basically going backwards or standing still um but you can use trying to pursue excellence as a it's a sense of purpose right it's a shared purpose amongst a group amongst a team and even individually it's a shared purpose it's a shared goal um you have to sacrifice, you have to give everything, you have to basically lay it all down to try and reach what you're trying to do, right? So when you say expect excellence, it's a, it's a moving target. It's a, it's a goal that's always trying to be achieved. And I think if you ever get to it and say, oh, I am excellent or we are excellent, I think you're in a bad spot. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a something you have to pursue and you have to keep on and you keep raising the bar because you get closer and closer. You've got to move the bar again, and it gives you that shared sense of where we're going for something here. We're trying to reach something, um, and it gives you that community of, again, trickling back to the culture. If we're all trying to get there together, it gives you a sense of belonging, right, that you need to actually try and get there. So it's, <clears throat> I don't think I can put what is excellence into a sentence except what I just said, really, it's just, it's an ongoing challenge to reach. And a few sentences may do it far better than one ever would. So that's, uh, that's fine. Um, just give me, if you could, Tone, a couple of, uh, like, actionables, or if you're seeing somebody embody it, what does it look like? You know, let's, let's talk kind of granular level of, of coaching and preparation or, 
upskilling or you know just obviously you we've, we've been clear you are in an elite performance environment so the expectations are naturally going to be higher but but talk about you know what you would look at and see yeah that that guy that girl is embodying exactly kind of what i have in mind when we when we talk about that because i think practical examples often could be you know could be quite powerful so is there anything that springs to mind um i could probably give you a comparison that's probably the best way let's go so yeah think, let's go i think if i compared two coaches i'm not going to name coaches obviously but one coach has a massive experience uh, a good playing experience a very good player um on the field between the lines excellent does great work relationships with players um and it's just it's just a, it's a soccer person switched on and just a good person to have around for me that's also excellent right that's great but then i've got the other side of the coin where i've got a guy who actually playing background um preparation for games off the charts um post-match review off the charts excellent on the field um very conscientious very humble um and very into being a modern coach and pursuing further education pursuing further challenges pursuing i guess what you would call pursuing excellence as a as a coach so i've got these two guys um <clears throat> do i think number one is not excellent no is he as intelligent as number two no but his results and his methods are very very good where this guy number two is very intelligent, very thorough, very detailed. But I would also lean towards saying number two has a future in the game, has a a greater a greater cadence of reaching excellence than number one, because he's more detailed, he's more thorough, he's more pragmatic in the way he thinks. But he's very good on the field. So my point is. You can have two different sort of people all together and they can both pursue excellence in their own way. But number one, I don't think will ever reach the level of number two because number two has a greater view of what excellence is. So his preparation is unbelievable. His post-match is unbelievable. His information is fantastic. His sessions are fantastic. He has a greater chance for me of achieving what we want than number one. But number one's not useless. Just because he's not great at the other things, he may be better on the field and he may achieve more on the field than number two. Does that make sense? I guess I'm trying to relate what it is, no. you know. Well, I'll jump in if you if you need to. Obviously, this is it, it makes me think about the, the whole leadership discussion we're having and accountability and where responsibility is given and where the accountability is the line is drawn and as a as a leader as an educator tony when when you have two not polar opposites they're both excellent in their own right um how do you measure what are the measurables for for you in terms of okay if one is further ahead than the other how can i look at this without bias and say they both have a capacity to reach their end goals but what do i a do in terms of resources of supporting them in their growth and development of providing opportunities of providing challenges to really test them um what's my accountability as a leader and an educator um what, what are the boundaries and, and where are their where's their accountability and their boundaries in terms of their own self development and, and upskilling do you do you do that do you have a, a process in place that manages that yeah, we so basically this is my first year off the field in 20 odd years, which was a an adjustment in itself. Um, and I, I had a hard time coming to grips with what my responsibilities and role was now compared to what it was in the past. 
Um, so what we do is now we we tend to foc I tend to focus on the coaching elements that they need help with. Some don't need help off the field with preparation and there's a step we have a standard at the academy of what preparation is. Now you can take that preparation to the nth degree if you like. If you feel it's it's pertinent to what the players need, right? Um, but you can also do the bare minimum of preparation and it'd be okay. Does that make sense? All based on different personalities. However, if you do no preparation and you do no um, review and no accountability or anything else, then you cannot work with us. You cannot continue to work with us as we move forward because this is the standard, again, boundaries, and you have to work within the boundaries of that of the academy. Okay. So um I'm sorry, my daughter is whispering out here. Can you give me two minutes, please? So the the, the my wife's a nurse, so I'm daddy daycare at the moment. I'm sorry. <clears throat> a different kind of management altogether, let me tell you. Um so I, I've lost my train of thought now. If the if they cannot work within the boundaries of what you said, then obviously it's going to be, they're going to struggle. However, you cannot give up and say, right, they're not doing it, you can't do it, we're done. You have to give them every opportunity to swim or sink. So by giving them support and by saying, look, here's what you can do. Try doing it this way, try doing this, try doing that. Um, then you at least give them the opportunity to be accountable, to improve, to get better and to move along. Like if I give up on number one, because number one's not great at preparation and not great at review, and his relationships with the players are off the field are not great because he just thinks about the field all the time, then, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. He, uh, but then I if I give up on him, then it's not fair to me to say at the end of the year, look, you can't work here without trying to make him better, without saying, here are the things that can make you better. Are you prepared to do them? Yes, I'm prepared to do them. Okay, now let's do them. And let's check in every few weeks. And if they're not being done, then you get a fair sense of the guy anyway. You get a fair sense of who the coach is. And if he's not doing it and he's not improving and he's not getting better, then, then he has to go. Then he has to move on to a level which is his level. On the flip side, we videotape the training sessions. So now we videotape training. I break it down, I pull it apart, I have them in, and we do a one-on-one. -on -one. Are they accepting of that? Do they accept that the uh, the points I make? Like, that exercise was not anywhere near the principle of play. What were you doing with that exercise? Explain to me. And I give them the chance to explain. But, again, they've got to be open, and they've got to be open to uh, to criticism. They've got to be open to feedback. And that's part of being a good coach as well and trying to improve. So those are the mechanisms that are in place with us. But my job now is to make coaches better. My job now is to make coaches the best they can be and to fulfill their potential. That's my job. That's, that's what I feel my job is right now, as well as trying to produce the best program we can. Now I have to take my crew, like I take Jack, for example, who has... Sorry. Hey, Kat, Tony. Give him a minute. Bring him in, Tony. Bring him in. Is it all good? We're a family no, here. Don't worry, mate. Don't <laughs> um, I'm sorry. The uh, It's authentic. There you go. It's very authentic. Um, I've lost. Oh, so take Jack, for example. Sorry. Worked at, played at the highest level, played for his country, UEFA Pro, came into us and didn't understand game model because West Ham. That wasn't their way. That wasn't what we... So do I go, it's Jack Collison. I don't need to help Jack Collison. I don't need to help Jack get better. No, I feel like I've got a responsibility to show Jack what we mean by game model. How do we implement game model? What's the process to putting it into practice? And I go out there and I show him. So that's where I feel responsible for the, the, the betterment of the coaches. Some take it, some don't. Some believe everything you say, some take bits and pieces from you. Um, another coach needs help on game day. They're not great on game day on the sideline at reacting or making a quick decision or 
thinking about things quickly. And you need to spend time with them. But they have to be accepting of that. They have to be accepting of you being there to help them. And I think that's the struggle for some younger coaches who maybe don't have the hours on the sideline that other coaches do, where they say, well, maybe I, I don't like the way you coach. Well, okay, you don't like the way I coach, but I still know what I'm doing on the sideline so I can help you. Again, and that, it's being accepting of it. And that's where I want to go, Tone, with blending the start of what you said prior to, to Willow's second question there. So I blended the two. Um, obviously education is something incredibly important to you personally. Um, I, I believe I, I saw one of only six at the time to have an academy director's license and obviously the EFCL award from the French Federation. So you've obviously been very intentional about your upskilling. Um, the coach one and coach two concept that you just presented yeah. with the very apparent multidisciplinary dual rollism of of what coaches need to do on a day-to-day -day basis now as the game is evolving um how important is it in your opinion that, that coaches continue to find both formal and informal sources to to educate themselves to to upskill um to be more prepared more able to deal with the demands of the, of the modern game but then also back onto you that, that as a leader, you embodied that yourself. So if you could. I think it's, um, it's the most important thing you can do as a coach. It's the most important thing you can do um, to improve, to get better. It's just, you cannot get away with it. Oh, missed you. Where'd I go? You still there? Yeah, we're still here, mate. We can still see yeah. you. You're good. I can't see you for some reason. I don't know what happened. <laughs> if you try down the bottom of your screen, yep. uh, you, you got us. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's the most important thing, to be honest, to get out and obviously watch other coaches work. I think we were talking before we started here. That Tata Martino changed my outlook on football that I thought I had a decent grasp on. Going through the US um, Academy Director's License and the French at the same time for two years, completely spun me around because one month I was with them, the, the French, and one month I was with the US, completely contrasting courses. Um, I've got no idea how I got through it, um, but I did. It taught me a lot about myself, I guess. But again, then I think Matt will tell you the same thing about the French course. It strips you of who you are. It strips you of who you thought you were and how to be honest, how good you thought you were, you take a step back and you go, you know what, you're not that good. And that's where a lot of it changed for me. Um, but if you don't get out there and you don't educate and you just sit on your license that you have and say, well, I have this license, then you're going to stay the same as a coach. That's as simple as that. If you don't educate yourself, if you don't educate yourself, even not with a license, if you don't get out and go watch somebody else who you think you can learn from, then you're not going to get any better. You're not going to get, you're not going to change. You're not going to evolve. You're not going to adapt. And if you go back to what we're talking about, which is pursuing excellence, you're not going to pursue it because you stand still and you start to regress. So for me, if you, if you don't, if you're not educating yourself, if you're not reading, even just reading, if you're not even reading about football and trying to, find something else, then I don't think you can get better as a coach. And I don't think you can get better as a manager or a leader or anything else in the business world even. If you're not constantly trying to improve your sense, your feel, your whatever it is you, you're looking for. But you cannot not do anything and think that you're going to get better. And how important, Tone, is it for the coaches to embody the same expectations that they're asking the players to you know if you're asking the players we speak about this quite regularly it's a it's a challenge in our industry of coaches being comfortable asking players to go and get better but kind of refusing somewhat to do it themselves so in your broader culture the when you expect excellence it's i, I can only imagine that that you're hoping that the staff don't just embody it on the field but off the field as well and and in regards to their own kind of continual development, is that fair? 
Yeah, absolutely. Listen, if, if you want someone to dig a hole, the easiest way to get them to dig a hole is get in the hole and dig it with them. <laughs> and that's a little bit cliche again, but it, it never rings so true when you, you're talking about asking someone to do something. You can sit in your ivory tower and you can bark your orders all you want. And no one's ever going to question that to a point, but the real guy gets down and does it with him or gets down and just leads by example. And again, leading by example, it's a cliche. Everyone says it, but do you do it? <laughs> it's easy to say, but it's an action of doing it that, that, that counts. So I think, honestly, if, 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 you, if you're not prepared, again, to do the things you need to do as a, as a coach, as a leader, and you're asking somebody else to do them, they're going to say, no, why should I? Why should I do that if you're not doing anything to improve either? So we sent a video message out to uh, the kids last week. And it was me on my bike in my basement with my Atlanta United flag on the wall and my weights, my little gym I've got downstairs. And all the lads were like ripping it out of me. Like, oh, you're not going to send that out. Oh, yeah, you're not going to send that out. I said, look, but if one kid sees me on a bike, Pat Annan, the director, right? <laughs> if he sees me on a bike saying, come on, lads, we're going to be back soon. Make sure you're in shape. Make sure you're ready. Make sure you're ready to go. And I'm sweating. If he sees me and goes, you know what? I need to go for a run. Then I've done my job. And they were ripping it out of me on the on the group chat. And I was like, look, at the end of the day, dig the hole and they'll dig it with you, right? So that was what the message was all about. And they're all like laughing at me. I was like, I'm sending the message out. It's going. So, yeah. but again, that's a big part of leadership. A big part of being the the figurehead is. If a 12, 13 year old kid goes out for a run because I was on a bike, then great, I've done it. For sure. And that's that's part of what you're what you're asking me, I think, is I have to be accountable to my actions as well as to make the staff do what I need them to do to, to get better as well, you know. Right. Go ahead, Lola. Can, can I just reinforce a point that Tony made that really resonates with I hope a lot of people on the on the call. You mentioned going through the, the two licenses. Um and it stripped him of, of everything he thought he was and who he was and um, how good he was. And I think for any coaches, any educators on the line, and I've been through this a few times, um, until you've been through that process, you don't realize how vulnerability and humility, how valuable they are to your growth. And, you know, be, being brave enough, having the courage to strip yourself back and remove your ego to let new information come in and challenge your belief systems and change it as well if if what your the journey you're on isn't isn't working or isn't um isn't helping people around you develop and as tony you mentioned elevating other people i think that's where a lot of coaches i've worked with in the past and had a staff and i'm sure you've all had this issue before is when that ego barrier is there when there's not that level of vulnerability and humility to go you know what give, give me my low light reel Give me my critiques. I need to understand what I need to get better at for the betterment of the club and environment, but also for the betterment of myself. So I, I just love the point you made there about being stripped back to your bare bones in, in um, your knowledge and, and what you thought you knew. Yeah, I mean, the, I think one of the biggest problems for me over my career is I've always been in charge of the clubs. So at Concord Fire, you know, I was the director of coaching on paper, but I never got critiqued. <clears throat> And that's me in my 20s. So in, the, in my 20s, I've got good teams because I've got good players. Let's make no mistake about that. Um, I'm winning state cups, whatever it was back then, tournaments, surf cup, everything, right? I'm winning games, but I'm not getting critiqued. I was a lunatic. I was, I was a terrible coach. But if I look back at it now, in my mid-20s, I mean, I was crazy. Um, but no one ever critiqued me. Then I went to Norcross, and I was the executive director. Again, nobody critiqued me. George United, um, UFA, I was the executive director. Again, nobody's walking in my office and saying, you're not good enough. You're not, that's not good enough. So by the time I was, what, mid-30s, I had had success, what, we, what I called success then. Um, I thought I was a really good coach because I was winning. Um, but I'd never been ripped apart. Nobody ever said, you know, even on like doing my B license, my A license and all that, 
I sailed through them as well. It's like, and then you hit, what, how old was I? Probably 39, 40, I think, when I went on EFCL. And all of a sudden, it was like this wave of, holy shit, like, this isn't, I'm not this bad. There's no way I'm this bad. There's no, I've been really successful. I've done this, I've done that. And then you just go, bang, and you hit the bottom. And I don't mind admitting that. I mean, it's, it's, I put it down, I don't know, I put it down to uh, a good life experience, but at the end of the day, I'm glad I, I was successful when I was younger. I'm glad I did well and all that, but if I hadn't have done EFCL, if I hadn't have done that course, I don't know what I would have been today. But I know what I am now, and I, I've discovered what I am and what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, which is another quality that you need to know is what you're not good at. And that's why you need to elevate people around you who are good at those things to compliment you and make the team better. So it's and kind think, of a, yeah, go on. No, I was just going to say, I think that's a great call to action for anybody listening. Uh, I think if, if you can stand there in the, in the position that you hold and with the experience that you've had and, you know, explain how, how important an educational experience was to, to shaping you as both a person and a professional, that's a, it's, I guess, the biggest testament that, you know, that, that could come um, for challenging anybody that's listening right now and still has a way to go on their journey to, to go and get out there and, and get uncomfortable. Um, and then yeah. I just turn to, to Chris. Chris has just popped up with a question, just as we're on the concept of education. Um, with, with mentioning education, what are some either online resources, books, podcasts that have had an impact on you? Is there any that you could just kind of share from personal, just personal reference that might be of use to people? Uh, there's a Pochettino podcast out there right now. That's excellent. Uh, Real Ferdinand one I just listened to the other day as well. I thought I thoroughly enjoyed that one. Um, there's a one Joey Barton did with Sean Dyche last year or the year before. I, I really enjoyed that because Dyche is a very, very authentic person and he gets a lot of criticism about his style of play and this and the other. But when you listen to him talk, he's a, he's a very intelligent man and he's, he likes people to think he's not which is another style of <laughs> tricking people into doing things you want. But he, uh, those podcasts are really good. Um, what book? I just read the book Grit. If you haven't okay. read Grit, get Grit. If you have children, get Grit. Because it'll <laughs> change the way you parent too. But um, Grit's a, a great one. Um, there's a book out there as well called The Mental, I think, Mental Monster. Motivation, yeah, I think it's called The Mental Monster. That's a good book, um, especially if you're into like the, the psychology of everything, the sport. Um, those are my latest things I've been doing between uh -huh. and after and trying uh -huh. to get the projects for the, their homework projects while we're in quarantine. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've got I've got one more question, um, as I know we're kind of approaching the, the end of the hour um, and I'll, I'll let anybody Guys on the line, if there's anything that you specifically want to ask, please just kind of pop it in there now. Um, so mine is, uh, obviously, there's there's a number of people on the line that um, are not current professionals that, that may have aspirations to go on to walk in the shoes that you're currently in. So from a non-professional background into, you know, into a professional environment, um, what were the challenges of that transition to you you know, what were the hurdles that you had to overcome? And ultimately, how did you do it? Because as, you, as you've referenced, there are people like Jack and your staff that have, you know, a depth of a playing career and have, and have been involved at the game at a higher level as a player than you ever were. Um, so can you talk through just, you know, some of the, the real challenges with that and, and kind of how you found your way to being as successful as you, as you have with it? Um... Advice, I guess, would be the first thing. Um, Search advice from others. Yeah, listen to others' advice. When I was younger, I didn't think I needed to, but now I'm older, I appreciate other people's advice. And my first thing would be, um, you're asking me to sort of tell my younger self, right? Is that what you're saying? I you mean, this to? is more just, obviously, you, you've gone... We can we can ask that we can we can speak about advice to you, but but more the people on the line that are non that, that are in clubs, right? That might want to work in an MLS academy, that might want to be an academy director in an MLS club, that 
a shift in from a non-professional to a professional environment without, you know, maybe a significant playing background to support to support them. You know, kind of how did you do it? You know, right. That's kind of. Uh, I think it goes down. I think it goes back to my thing about putting hours on the clock. Right. I've took. I say this all the time to the lads as well: is don't take the elevator, take the stairs. And fall down the stairs a few times and you know scuff your knee and get back up and climb the stairs but i don't think if i didn't do everything i did um at different levels like not everybody wants to work with the paralympic team right the paralympic team are a team with tbis um cerebral palsy and uh stroke victims right so it's not beautiful football right it's seven to say it's not everybody wants to do that but I felt like it was a good opportunity to do something different in football and gain a different experience. Um, not everybody wants to work for free. I went and worked as an assistant on the Silverbacks every morning for free. I didn't get paid a penny, but I thought, you know what? If I want to be a professional coach, I need to do this and experience the professional team in Atlanta at the time. Um, I did a lot of work for free. I didn't get paid by George United, but I spent 40 hours a week on George United, but I didn't take a dime because it's what I wanted to do. It's the level I wanted to work at, and it was the level of players I wanted to be involved with. So I did a lot for free. Um, mm. I did a lot of different things in different areas of the sport that I felt were rounding me as a person, as a coach. Um, but I put as many hours on the clock as I could before I even thought about, right, it's time for me to look to another level. But again, the more education you do, the more you get out there and search for answers, the more the hunger in you becomes, you know what, I need to get out and I need to do something on a higher level. Um, the challenges are, I didn't have a massive playing career as a professional player. I was at West Brom as a youth and then at non-league teams. And then I came to the States. So that goes against you a little bit, which is a bias, which I don't like, but it's out there. That's a challenge to overcome that. So to overcome that, you've got to be the best coach you can. So whatever you're doing and whatever team you're working with and whatever club you're at, be the best person there. Because at the end of the day, I hired Matt Lowry from Richmond Strikers, or Richmond United, and Matt didn't have a playing background, but he was the best 12s guy around that I knew and heard of. I went and tried to hire Matt. Um, Steve Cavino, one of my best coaches, under 14 coach up in New York State in Al what's, in, what, what's the name of the place up in New York? You should know your Albany. Right Albany, sorry, Albany. Um, one of the best coaches in Albany, and he's and he was young. He was 28, 29, and I said, you know what? I like him. He's really good. I'm going to bring him in. No playing background to speak of as a is a big pro and all that, right? So there's opportunities. Um, they're coming less and less because more players are coming back into the game. And unfortunately, GMs and TDs like all players in their clubs. But for me, education, educator first, playing background second. If you can do both, brilliant. But for me, you have to be an educator. You've got to be really good at what you do because there's a ton of good players who I've played with and who are still playing. Who have come out and I've gone, not for me. That's not going to work for me. And that's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a common occurrence that good players don't make good coaches. And that's, maybe right. let's call this the cliche, uh, the cliche podcast that I've throughout today. But I was going to say, you've dropped a few. Good players and make good coaches. And to be honest, there is opportunities for young coaches who are very bright, who are very switched on, but they need hours on the field. You need hours on the sailing, you need hours on the training pitch. And when you get your chance, if you get a chance, you need to be able to, I don't bring anybody in blind. I go watch them in their own environment and then I bring them in and I give them something to do and judge them on that. So it's, there's opportunities, but you've got to be ready when the opportunity comes. Right. And that's what I'm trying to say, all those things I've done over my career, that it wasn't strategic to say, right, I've got to do this because I might get there. I might do this because I might get there. I'm not a very good networker. I'm not a really big networker. I don't like to, I mean, I know everybody because I'm an old man now, but when I was younger, I didn't like to 
running the circles that I had to run in to get a job, you know, so it's networking will get you somewhere, but it won't get you on the pitch if you're not good enough. I'll, I'll take that advice, Tony. I was an average player for 17 years, so hopefully that's not hindering me. If good players don't make good coaches, I might be in with a shout. <laughs> I was terrible, mate. <laughs> um, Tony, obviously you, you caught me on on the last one. Let's let's close with this from us. So you, you've obviously there's there's so much information already there, but if we could just finish with the advice to your younger self, let's let's build on. Um, build on going and getting more from people. But if, if there's any other kind of, you know, a couple of pearls of wisdom that's that's left un, uh, unturned over the last 20 years, what, what would it be if you could look back and know what you know now? There is so much I would tell my younger self. <laughs> <laughs> on the field well, mate, and off the field, believe me. It worked um, out, it worked out. So you didn't do everything wrong. But as a, as a leader and as a people person, as I'd like to say, my biggest advice is do not judge people from other people's opinions. Do not judge people because of their intelligence. Them are the two major mistakes I've made in the past that I would write and try and get right now, which would be do not judge somebody just because they're intelligent. Don't think that, you know, they're better than you because they're intelligent. Because there's a lot of what I would call not unintelligent, but not studious people that are really, really switched on and really good and give you good advice. And then the same thing, don't judge people on somebody else's opinion of that person because that's the biggest mistake you can make. Those are my two gems I live by now. Hey, hey oh, that's... Just to finish off there, you mentioned intelligence. There's a great book out there by Todd Rose, The End of Average, and it speaks about intelligence being very multi-dimensional so i couldn't agree more with just because somebody appears to have intelligent or background of knowledge um yeah i, I believe intelligence comes in many shapes and forms <laughs> there, there you go, go. Yeah. you're famous see you on tv see you that uh, one. No. Oh, there we go let's well, let's time it in this because obviously uh you've got to go and resume daddy kate daycare service so uh, Tony, on behalf of myself, of Willow, everybody at, at Beyond Pulse, um, everybody listening now, everybody listening in the future, thank you ever so much for, for the hour, for the honesty, the insight, the vulnerability, um, the education, the guidance, everything, the lessons have been have been tremendous. So thank you. Uh, thank you tremendously from, from all of us. Um, to everybody that's listening, obviously, we're we're going to be going again. Um, stay tuned to social media for uh, updates for the rest of the week. We should have um, a couple more tremendous guests lined up. So as always, thank you for choosing us as your afternoon entertainment um, and your source of learning for a day. And yeah, Tom, thank you ever so much, mate. Really, truly appreciate well, it. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it, last, guys. Last yeah. one, actually. Where can they find you? Obviously, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Is there anywhere that we can go to, to get a little bit more of, of you if the, if the people are less familiar? How can they follow you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Forced to by social media at the club. <laughs> That's the best yeah. excuse. And um, we'll make sure that we, we'll yeah, sure that we mean, tag yeah. you, obviously. I'm also... I'm, I'm not one that ducks an email, if, it's, if it makes sense. You know, I've obviously got limited time to, to answer everybody's questions, but I'm... I'm happy to engage on an email now and again as well to if uh -huh. it helps somebody out. So I'm not I'm not above answering someone's questions on email at all. No, that's great. Well, again, thank you ever so much, mate. Really, really, really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, guys.